and welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. I'm your host, Taylor Fossack. I'm the lead engineer at IT Pro TV. And with me today is one of the engineers on my team, Cameron Guerra. Thanks for joining me today, Cam. Thanks for having me, Taylor. I'm excited to be here. It's been a, it's been a minute since we've done this, you know, so I'm, I'm glad to get back into it. Yeah, we uh, took a month off there around Thanksgiving. I guess we needed some time to recuperate from those large meals. Mm -hmm. All that turkey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, today we're in December. It's uh, here in Florida. It's actually a little chilly for once, which has been really nice. Um, and, you know, the holiday season's upon us. And there's an awesome project that's been out there for a couple of years now called Evan of Code. Um, and so I've been working on it, Taylor. You've been kicking my butt at it, but, you know, <laughs> Taylor's also working on it. Um, and I just want to, you know, let our listeners know that that's available to you if you're interested. Um, you can solve it in any language you want, but, you know, I'd encourage Haskell. Taylor's doing Elm. Um, so there's, you know, it's all about getting to the right answer. Um, and so that actually kind of leads us into today's topic because, you know, in Advent of Code, we're doing a lot of parsing. And in this edition of Haskell Weekly, which is edition 241, there is a blog post called Parser Combinators Walkthrough. And I was like, oh, sweet, this is awesome. I need this. Um, and, you know, the author, Antoine LeBlanc, did a great job of explaining this. Uh, and I'm really excited to kind of chit chat about it. So, the parsing expert ourselves, from at least not, it's not Antoine, but it's Taylor. You know? <laughs> so, he's, he's the expert here. So, I'm probably going to be pinning him with a lot of questions. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm ready. Obviously, I know what a parser is. <laughs> And luckily, Antoine talks about that, uh, which is just, you know, the ability to read through some sort of um, stream and transform it into some other data type. And right. The most common one in Haskell is generally a string. You parse a string by each character and you go parse it into something else. Um, and here he focuses on, you know, understanding what Parsec does and what it is and kind of rebuilds it to then kind of make a JSON parser out of yeah. it. So. And you, you touch on a lot of things that I want to uh, build on just a little bit. So um, yeah, a parser at a high level is something that takes some input and produces some output, but that basically describes a function as well. So that's a little too general. Usually mm -hmm. when we think of parsers, we're thinking of parsing strings and in Haskell, we're turning them into more structured data types. So one thing that we've talked about before on this podcast is the difference between parsing and validating. So parsing, like you consume your input and produce something that tells you more about it. You know more information at the end versus validation is like you already have some data on hand and you just check something about it. Right. Um, and like you mentioned, string is a really common input type for parsers, but it doesn't have to be strings. You can parse byte string, you can parse JSON. I mean, and when I say parse JSON, I mean like you could use JSON as your input type and then produce something else at the end. So with a library like ASON, when you're doing the um, from JSON instance, you could think of that as like, I'm taking a JSON input and producing some custom type as the output. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a helpful way to think about it, but. Um, yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense to me. I, I just, you know, I have really, excuse me, I've really never taken the time to understand what's happening underneath. I just kind of say, oh yeah, it's, it's parsing JSON into our new data type. Right. And that's, it's fine. Uh, but when I'm, you know, working on an advent of code problem where I'm saying, all right, let me take in this stream of input and I need to make sure, you know, I need to parse it and then also validate it afterwards, which, you know, since I have the data type and I can parse it into a known, you know, ADT for say, I have, I, I think hair color is something I'm trying to parse right now. <laughs> and, you know, you have a certain op number of options for that. Um, and so yeah. I could parse that into a specific, you know, data type that would be easier to, to understand and say check against yeah that's a really natural fit for uh parsing into a data type because instead of matching on a string and having some you know underscore match that says this should never happen you know this is an impossible case you can actually just rule it out um mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but you yeah, should but see the code right now it's uh <laughs> it's i'm using data.txt and i'm doing a lot of infix uh, is infix of mm -hmm. and innies and alls and it's no good. So yeah, and hopefully after we finish talking about parser combinators, and you can apply this to your advent of code solution, you'll be able to look and see like, oh yeah, using a parser here 
makes code that's both easier to read and easier to maintain and easier to see what's going on versus the like poking around and plucking substrings out of stuff like you might do in some other languages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a great little segue is like, where, where do we start with Parsec? Like what's a good place to start understanding and how, you know, Parsec and Parsec combinators work? Yeah. So this post obviously is a great place to start, but it's not the first resource for something like this. And, uh, it's been a while since I was learning how parser combinators work. So I, I want to say that like the parsec documentation or mega parsec or add parsec, any of those are probably fine to understand like the API that they expose, but to figure out how it works behind the scenes, you're going to need a resource like this or, um, Steven deal wrote one a while ago where he goes through the same thing of building up a parser combinator from scratch. And I'm sure other people have written things as well. So, um, I'll try to include links to those things in the show notes, but, um, yeah, this is a great resource. So let's, let's dive right in. Yeah. So, uh, the first thing he does is obviously give you a, a type signature and show you that parsec is really just a function. Uh, you know, you're taking some string and, and transforming it into some a, um, and you know, that's not always going to be successful. So he actually creates it, you know, it returns an either. So you can kind of catch a parsing error and display that to your user. So then they can understand, oh, my input's incorrect. Let me change that. Um, and so, you know, that's a good little you know, place to start. And then he's like, all right, well, enough of that. We're done. Cool. Let's move <laughs> on. We've got, you know, two really cr crux parsers, right? That are super low level. Are they low level or high level? They're they're low level, I think. Right. That's what I would have thought. They're as like well. primitives it's, almost. Right. And and that's the idea of, you know, an any parser and an end of file parser. So an any parser just says, keep giving me stuff while there is stuff. And then bar uh, the end of file parser says, Oh, there's nothing left to parse. We're done. Mm -hmm. Here's your output, or here's your and, result. And both of these things are quote unquote combinators. I know that when I was learning functional programming in Haskell and parser combinators, that term kind of threw me off. Like, what does it mean exactly? So from this post, the any function that is a parser and the EOF, sorry, I, I called it function. It's a parser value, which itself is a wrapper around a function, but any mm -hmm. and EOF are both people would refer to them as combinators. So if you hear parser combinator, that's kind of the thing they're talking about. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. So, you know, that covers the, the two base cases. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just wanted to touch on why those two are base cases because our, the function type that we have says you give me a string and I'll give you effectively either a result or an error. Right. Mm -hmm. And these two combinators, any and EOF let us step through the entire input. So we can go one character at a time, just give me each character as it comes along and I'll do something with it. And then I'll hit the end. Um, we're going to need a couple more things and what we're building here may not be very efficient. You can imagine going one character at a time. Isn't the fastest thing in the world. Sometimes, you know, you can skip a bunch of characters. Mm -hmm. Um, but this is enough to show you how these things work. Gotcha. So. How, how does it, I, I guess any is recursive, right? Is that, is that what's happening or how, how do we continually get through, you know, a string? Like what, what in Parsec does that? Yeah, it can be a little tricky to wrap your head around. And I think throughout this episode, we'll probably say Parsec and we may not actually mean the Parsec library. We may be talking about what they're showing here. Um, but what, what he's showing here, the way that you carry that string around and like, quote unquote, update your state, as you might think of it in a normal imperative language, is you take a string as input and what you return is a tuple that has a string and then that either I talked about before. So you take your input and then you produce like the rest of the input after that. So with the any combinator, you're taking one character off the front of your input and then passing the rest of it uh, back to the caller. Okay. That makes sense. It can be a little tricky to wrap your head around because you're right. Like using this will typically kind of feel recursive, but the any function itself doesn't use recursion. Okay. That's, that's good to know. Cause that's where like, you know, looking at the 
Parsec library and kind of looking at the API exposes, I'm like, okay, but how do I use these things? Like, <laughs> I know I can see what they are and I understand the type signatures, but like, how do I use them? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think diving down a little bit into you know, his version, you know, uh, of any EOF, you know, is helpful to uh, just kind of grok that idea. Uh, yeah, I and, and I would have liked seeing a little more high-level motivation at the top. I think he's kind of taking for granted that you already know what it will look like to use this thing at the end, and you're curious about how is it implemented. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, toward the end when he gets into parsing JSON, uh, he mentions that, or he shows, like, this is how you will parse a JSON value. You'll say, like, this constructor F mapped over this parser, or this constructor over that one. Um, and so that's, I think, kind of what you were touching on of, like, okay, I can see how all these what the type signatures of all these pieces are, but how do I actually use them together? Right. So, yeah, I mean, it is also very nice to know what's happening underneath. I, mm -hmm. I don't discount that at all, but as someone who hasn't put into practice, like I, I read this today knowing that, okay, I want to take this tomorrow and you know run with it for uh, advent of code and parsing, you know, this hair color thing that I'm trying to, to figure out what it is mm -hmm. and make sure it matches the rules that they've placed um, upon it. So, yeah, I, I definitely feel like I got a little bit more value at the end of this article. But, um, you know, moving along, you know, I think talking about you know, sequencing these parsers is, um, you know, parsing is sequential in its nature right like you're moving through something to translate it into some other data type mm -hmm. um and so you know he he kind of dives in a little bit of like how a parser might help and how it allows you know you to be in the parser monad that then you know, makes it a little easier to to comprehend and follow um yeah, I feel like this is, maybe it's intentional, or maybe it's accidental, but it seems kind of like a good introduction or a good Monad tutorial, which is kind of a meme in the Haskell community. But he starts by showing what it would look like to use one of these parsers if you had to pattern match on the result every time. And it sucks, you know, you keep indenting more and more and you have to match every time you capture a value. And uh, it feels to me, or it looks to me a little bit like handling errors in Golang, where you say, if there was a problem, then panic, otherwise keep going. And you just do that over and over again. And then he shows how you can take that and improve it a little bit by writing another combinator called and then, where you give it a function with the result you expected, and it'll string all these things together for you. So you can hide away some of that complexity. And this to me looks a lot like the Elm way of doing things, where there's no special syntax or anything, and it's all very straightforward what's going on. But because of that, there's a lot of extra noise where you have to plug all these things together. And then you get to like kind of the whole reason, one of the reasons that Haskell exists, this special syntax around monads where you can make it look like the same code you would write for IO or maybe or either or any other monad that you use in Haskell, boom, you can use it for a parser too. And I, I like that progression. I think that's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, honestly, I think you know, I know there's fancy ways to do, you know, this parsing, but I'm probably going to start with like, all right, let me use do notation and get this piece of it. And then say, all right, now I've got this piece of it. Uh, I think that will be super helpful Yeah, and, and, and re easy to reason about. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a natural fit because like you said, parsing is sequential, or at the very least we can think of it as sequential. Sometimes you can jump around so like if you're parsing a json string you could skip to the next uh double quote and just say okay well everything in there is probably a string and i'm going to jump ahead if you're looking for something else but again that's an optimization so yeah looking right. at the sequentially of do notation like look for this character then look for a space then look for this other character it's really easy to wrap your head around that mm -hmm. yeah no i think that's awesome and like i said there's more complicated processes which is like you know, there's a lot of infix operators here that make your life easier, but if you're not familiar with, you know, their types of signatures and what they're actually doing, it can get a little bit confusing and can get yeah. backwards easily. Do notation definitely has the advantage of you could point pretty much anybody at it and they could probably guess what it does. 
Mm -hmm. These other operators are very convenient. And once you're familiar with the grammar they form, then it's a really succinct way to describe these things. Um, and a lot of Haskellers are already familiar with some of these operators, in particular, the uh, like angle bracket, dollar sign, angle bracket, the infix fmap operator. Right. We use that one all the time. And we also use the, I forget what people call it, like the spaceship or whatever, which is the, the angle applicative. bracket asterisk. Yeah, the applicative. Mm -hmm. um, and we use that to like build up records or something out of a bunch of different fields. Uh, right. But then there's there's the versions of those operators that only have one of the angle brackets. So they're like missing a side and that treats one side as special. So like it'll ignore the result from one side and give you the result from the other. Um, mm -hmm. And again, those are super convenient, but if you see these and you don't already know what they do, you might not be able to find out. Right. Yeah. So yeah, he kind of chit chats about some of those uh, infix operators as well. Um, so I do definitely see their value. It's just kind of a little blurry, but mm -hmm. I'm glad that this blog post is giving me insight. <laughs> well, my, my prediction is that as you get more comfortable with parsers, you will start to be a little annoyed by the common structure that you often do where you'll like parse one thing and then do a void parse something else and then parse some other thing. And right, that's very get... neatly captured by some of these operators. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh yeah, I want just the left side of this. Don't give me whatever comes from the right. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to circle back. So earlier when I was talking about combinators, the way that I think of parser combinators in my head is stuff that you use with these goofy operators. So like if you would plug it into this weird sequence of star angle bracket, you know, dollar sign, blah, 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 then mm -hmm. it's probably a parser combinator. <laughs> and Fair enough. that's a, that's a pretty wishy-washy definition, but works pretty well. Yeah. Seems to cover the basis. Mm -hmm. All right. So, you know, we, we've learned about this stuff. And, you know, we, how do we know we're getting the right thing? Like, how do we know that, you know, this string, you know, once we've quote unquote parsed it out of, you know, the, the larger string, how do we, we know what to transform it into? Like, how does that work? Yeah, that one is tricky a little bit. So we have to match on what we captured, right? So like, let's say mm -hmm. we grabbed some string and if that string is a double quote, then we know we're doing it, or that might be a bad example. If that, if that character is a, you know, square bracket, then we know we're going to start parsing an array at that point. Mm -hmm. And this is another place where recursion, I think comes in because usually what you're going to do is look for some special identifying character, like a square bracket or a curly bracket, and then call some other parser and that parser is going to parse a couple more characters and produce a value for you. So like, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm like null in JSON. That's a, that's a good example. So you may look for like, Hey, parse the letter in and then parse the letter U and then L and then L. And after you've done those four things, return or pure in the modern parlance, uh, pure the like JSON null value. And that's mm -hmm. how you're quote unquote, converting this string into a more structured value. Gotcha. You're, you're doing the parsing. And then after the parsing has succeeded, you're saying, this is the value I actually want to use. Right. So you're, yeah, you're just getting that chunk of data and saying, all right, now that I have this piece of information, does it turn transform into this proper? Uh, right. And, and null is kind of a, a weird example because you're not actually doing anything with your input. You're just making sure that you were given some input. Right. If you want to parse a number, you may parse, like, let's say you want to parse an integer, a positive integer. So you just parse some number of decimal digits in a row. Um, you still have to turn that into a number. And that part just depends on what data type you're trying to build. So, you know, for numbers, you would like uh, take each digit individually and convert it from a character into a numeric value and then add all those up with their respective, you know, multiplications for the, whatever base you're in. Mm -hmm. Um, so to answer your question, it depends. <laughs> that, that's how you yeah. turn stuff into hmm, structure. Sounds data. like Haskell. Hmm. <laughs> Everything. It just depends, mm -hmm. which it was totally cool. I love that flexibility and the, you know, the, the safety that it gives us. Um, it's great. Um, cool. Well, thank you for kind of diving in a little bit on that, uh, bit. So, like I was saying earlier, I, I'm going to be parsing something 
that could be a, one of, I think, eight things is, is the problem I'm currently trying to solve. Mm -hmm. What happens if, like, I, I, I think I think choice is what I want here, but like, if I have a list of, you know, match string matches, and I want to say, all right, it's got to match at least one of these. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like the idea of picking one, making a choice that is successful. Is that what I would want to do? Yeah, almost always. And um, choice itself, I don't think, uh, the Parsec library probably provides this, um, but the uh, the operator that it builds off of is this, another one of these special ones that is angle bracket pipe angle bracket. So it kind of visually looks like this or that. Um, the axe. Yeah, the, the battle well, axe. <laughs> I don't know, is it like a hammer, maybe? Uh, maybe a both. pickaxe. Yeah. Pick there we go. Um, and choice just glues together a bunch of things that you provide as a list so that you can uh, not use that operator a bunch. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you normally would say, I want this thing, or if it's not that thing, I want this other thing, or if it's not that other thing, I want this yet another thing. Um, and you have to be a little careful here because uh, the parser, as we've talked about, you can think of it as being sequential. So if you put something less specific higher up in your list, it may prevent your more specific thing from matching. So uh, to use an example, let's say you want to parse numbers. So you say, I'll take any any digit, any number of times. Okay. But then later you specifically want to parse the number zero because you do something special with it in your language. You're going to have to put zero before your general number parser. Otherwise it'll never parse it because it will already have been grabbed by the earlier one. Mm. Okay. So when you're doing that angle bracket, pipe angle bracket, that choice operation, you have to put more Order specific matters. stuff at the top. Yeah. And then less specific stuff below. Order okay. matters. And usually, or often I should say, your like attempts at parsing stuff are going to have different first characters. So it won't matter too much. Like with mm -hmm. JSON, you're parsing null or true or false, all, all of which start with a different character or you're parsing a number, which doesn't start with any of those characters, or a string, or an array, or an object. So they all start with different things. So mm -hmm. this isn't super important for that particular case. Gotcha. Okay, cool, yeah. So seems like choice is gonna give us, you know, based on which one it matches, whichever one it matches first, it's gonna give us that data. Uh, yeah. Okay, it has cool. It has no concept of like a best match or like a most specific match. Right. Which, yeah, that would be really tough to do. I mean, I'm sure it's possible, <laughs> but seems not worth it. Yeah, uh, just well, and order then you, things the way you want. Then you get out of that mental model of thinking of it as sequential, because then your model becomes well, it's going to try to parse everything, quote unquote, at the same time, and then it'll give me back the best one. Mm -hmm. And you know, there are parsers that can work like that. The one that we're building in this isn't like that, and I'm pretty sure Parsec isn't like that. Um, maybe you can muscle it into being that way, but I'm not sure. I mean, I'm, I'm the noob here, so you know, <laughs> don't quite know. Uh, okay, so what if we are iterating like, so say we have a list for some reason, or not some reason, it, it's a valid thing. We have a list and we all, we know it's separated by commas, like, and we just wanna get each piece of you know, data. How, how would we do that? What, what would that look like? Um, and yeah. Yeah. So this is another one of the combinators and, and I should have said this earlier, but at the top, when we had, um, any and EOF, those are like the primitives. They're absolutely necessary to do anything, but everything we've been talking about are also primitives. And in fact, many of them are defined in the control dot applicative module for either applicatives or a related type class called alternative. An alternative is the one that defines that choice operator, the, mm. the pickaxe. Um, and uh, these are, are generally useful. So like um, choosing the first of many options or parsing or selecting many things in a row or saying, I want lots of things separated by things. These are all general concepts and they happen to apply to parsers, uh, but they're not specific to parsers. So I should have said that earlier, uh, but mm -hmm. for, for separating by, so like this is really common, like with a JSON parsing an array. You say, give me a square bracket, or I, I want to match on a square bracket, and then some JSON value, and then a comma, and then some other JSON value, and just keep doing that. 
until you hit a closing square bracket. Um, and the sep by operator, which Parsec provides in this little library he's building up, also provides does that for you, where it um, this this is finally where we run into actual recursion, because set by has a companion function called set by one, and the difference between those two is that set by one needs at least one element to match inside, whereas set by can give you back an empty list. And these two functions take turns calling each other; they're mutually recursive, or, or maybe not these two, but he has a, a similar pair of functions called mini and mini one where mini will give you, could give you an empty list and mini one will always guarantee there's at least one thing in it. And this is a challenging thing to wrap your head around because mini calls mini one or it returns an empty list. And then mini one calls the parser and then calls mini, but then mini one comes back and calls it like they just bounce back and forth between each other. Um, so I know I struggled with that the first time I saw it, but it's, it's a little weird. Yeah. 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 Oh, I was like, I'm still, trying to crack it and i've read this like <laughs> three or four times now so it's like yeah i mean i i see the benefit but it's and like the need for it but it's just a little on the confusing side mm -hmm. so it, i think mini and mini one are a little easier to understand than set by and set by one so i'm going to focus on those and mm -hmm. just so you know i was talking about the alternative type class it defines mini and mini one but it calls mini one sum s-o-m-e which is super confusing because I can never remember, does mini mean it can be empty or does some mean it can be empty? And the answer is that it's mini, but I like that he went with mini and mini one. So the way that they work is that for mini, it tries to call mini one. And then if that fails, it returns an empty list. So it has that pickaxe operator there. It's doing a choice. So that means that if, it, if the parser that you're trying to match mini of did not succeed at least one time, then you're going to get back the empty list. Mm -hmm. And then we can consider mini one. So what mini one does is it runs that parser you gave it. So it'll look for, let's say a JSON value. And then it'll run that parser zero or more times after that by calling mini. So mm. it's just a way to say like, I, I, it, it's clever. It doesn't need to be done this way. You could write them not in terms of each other, but um, it, it is clever. Gotcha. So as soon as you get a uh, failing many one, you would then return an empty right. list. So it just keeps trying that parser over and over until it can't anymore. And then it says, okay, I'm done. You get back your empty list. And that'll be cons. You know, all the elements you found up until then will be cons on to it. Mm -hmm. hmm. Nice. Yeah, and if uh, if you're looking for like some experimental insight into how this works, you could use the debug.trace module to put a debug uh, at the first like line of each of these implementations to see how it bounces between them and what it has built up so far and what it's parsed. Um, mm -hmm. So that may be illuminating as well. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. That actually Parsec has like its own trace functions and stuff. Yeah, and, like put straight up in line, which is like, oh, okay. I mean, they're probably the same as debug.trace. They probably just... Mm -hmm. And uh, Parsec and probably the other related libraries, one of the benefits of using them is that uh, they have some utility functions that will print out a lot of debugging information as they go along. So you can... Uh, there's some function in Parsec that's like, you know, try to run this parser against this input and also spit out all the debugging info you generate along the way. And it, it may not give you down to the level of which combinator am I calling at any given time? But it'll be like, I'm examining this bit of input and this is the decision I made based on it. So that's cool. useful. Yeah. yeah. Um, cool. But yeah, sorry, bringing it all the way back around to set by. Um, the way that set by works is essentially by delegating to many and many one, but it will, because um, your separator means that you have to uh, parse that separator between parses, right? Mm -hmm. So like I'll parse a JSON value and then I'll parse a comma, and then I have to parse another JSON value after that. Um, and so set by just builds those two parsers together, the separator and the value in the right order, and then calls mini with it. Uh, I feel like I'm doing a poor job explaining this, but it, uh, it conceptually isn't that different than mini and mini one. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. I would definitely go, you know, 
have people check it out if they're um, curious. Yeah. So, Agreed. Yeah. Um, well, I know we've been chatting about this for a minute, and I, and I don't want to keep you know, our listeners too long, and I want to you know respect you know all of our times. So if you're interested in the parsing JSON section of this, check out the, pl- the post. It'll be in the show notes um, as well as in ep- uh, issue 241 of Haskell Weekly. So there's lots of places to go find it. Um, but that, that bit kind of puts it all together, you know, shows you how to, you know, take a, a set of information and then parse it all the way through and, and figure out which choice is going to succeed. Um, and they start with the most, um, most descriptive, which is like object. And then they move down as far as like what things can be parsed into. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you're interested in that, go check it out. Yeah. Um, It's a great resource, and I feel like some of the things that we've talked about are a lot easier to look at on screen. So, like, saying angle bracket, dollar sign, angle bracket is super clunky, but reading it's not that bad. Um, Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, reading something like the mini definition uh, just kind of rolls past your eyes, and you're like, wait a minute, what did I I just read there? Um, Yeah. But, yeah, it's a great resource. Go check it out. It'll be in the show notes. Yeah, and, I mean... Who knows? Well, maybe, maybe next week we'll see if I actually was able to figure out how Parsec works and actually succeed at day four, part two of Advent of Code, which I've been stuck on since December 4th. So <laughs> if, if you're you know, curious, that's where I'm at. And it's currently December 11th. So we're struggle busting here. But yeah, good, good luck. Gonna... <laughs> Thank you. I need it. I need it. Uh, but yeah, so thanks for being on the show, Taylor. It was, uh, you know, thanks for having me as well. It was fun to, to chit chat and catch up. Uh, it's been a little bit since we've got to do this. So yeah, I'm not uh, sure which one of us is uh, on the show and which one of us is having the other on the show, but you know, <laughs> I think it's our show. co-hosts. Yeah. yeah. So we're both doing each. Yeah. It's like our house in the <laughs> middle of the Haskell weekly. Yeah. Can we sing that? Do we have to pay royalties? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I made a, a spoof off of it. So do I have to? Right. It's, yeah. I don't know. think so. I, I didn't want to use it directly. Um, but yeah, <laughs> so yeah, it, it was fun to be here today. Um, you know, I want to also thank IT Pro TV, our employer, uh, for sponsoring this podcast and allowing us to, you know, chit chat, catch up, and, and, and spend some time, you know, sharing with the community what we're learning and what we're doing. Um, so I appreciate them a lot. Um, they also want to thank all of you guys um, for, you know, listening, and they wanted to offer you guys a promo code for 30% off the lifetime of your subscription using Haskell Weekly 30. Again, that is Haskell Weekly 30 for access to IT Pro TV, the e-learning platform for IT professionals. Yeah, man, go check it out, itpro.tv. Also, if you want to learn more about us, you can visit our website, haskellweekly.news. We're also on social media, Twitter, Reddit, YouTube, all that stuff. Um, And if you have suggestions for stuff you would like to see in the newsletter or you'd like to hear us discuss here on the podcast, excuse me, podcast, please let us know. You can email us info at haskellweekly.news or open an issue on GitHub, ping us on Twitter, whatever. Yeah. Or if you want to be on the show as a guest, just hit us up. Yeah. Yeah. We'd be happy to have a guest. Um, And yeah, I think that'll do it for us. There's two lonely souls here. (laughs) Yeah. Um, That will do it for us this week with any luck we'll see you again next week and uh happy holidays everybody happy holidays stay safe